Hi, everybody. So here at Sylvie Barbier, and we have today as our guest, Liam Kavanaugh. Do I say your name right, Liam? Uh, yeah, you can Liam Kavanaugh or Kavanaugh if you're being very Irish about it. Just depends. Wonderful. Maybe so the I, difference, but some people would. So I'm very excited to have you do a podcast together. Uh, Liam and I obviously known each other for now, I think, close to eight years. He's the co-founder of Life Itself, and um, I really wanted to capture his story. So often in the evenings, we play this game called Once Upon a Time for people to tell a little bit the story of their life. Mm -hmm. And I believe many people are actually quite curious about how did Liam became Liam? And what was so special about how you perceive life and the intention of this podcast is really to show that there's no heroes out there that every ordinary pe person can become extraordinary and choose an extraordinary path and I think you have a really interesting and extraordinary path Liam that's why I want to inquire about it um, so yeah Liam maybe you can start by saying a little bit about yourself uh, where you come from and what you do uh, before I can ask you more questions. No, yeah, okay. Um, so my name is, as you mentioned, Liam Kavanaugh. Um, I have trained as a cognitive scientist, which is something I came to kind of, well, I, I went to get a PhD relatively late after a, a, a career as an applied economist in my 20s. Um, I was always interested in, well, not always, but from a pretty young age, really interested in how does society work? Because um, I was just interested in like justice and injustice and things didn't seem like they made that much sense to me. So I kind of wanted to understand um, the social system from quite young age. Um, and um, right now I'm a co-director of the Climate Majority Project, which is my the main thing that I'm spending most of my time on right now, which is an effort to get serious climate action outside of the progressive uh, bubble uh, in which it is usually kept, um, basically to kind of provide a home for people who realize, oh, wow, we're staring the bar down the barrel of an ecological crisis. Uh, and I don't really feel at home in any of the organizations that put things frankly and want to do something about it. Mm, call it a metabolic right. movement if you like um there's a lot of that in there uh, for viewers who know what that means i won't go into a long-winded description of what that means right now but maybe we can get back to it later on yes absolutely so i guess i want to start with just understanding a little bit what was your family and social environment when you grew up and what were the values in which you grew up Oh, huh. so it was interesting. I was, I, well, let's see. So basically I, my first memories were really kind of shortly after we moved to the suburbs. So we was born in the city of Chicago and then moved out into the suburbs, uh, you know, when I was quite young. And so kind of really I started having memories after we'd moved out to an area. My, father was a custom home builder um well that was one of his jobs after he retired from being an American football coach uh and started a custom home building job or job and so he we moved to kind of an area that was like obviously going to develop so there was just basically nothing but like trees and there was maybe like three or four other houses um, but it was some, some, an area that was kind of obviously going to become a, you know, big American sprawl subdivision. Um, so I kind of just, yeah, it was, it was, went from being maybe four houses within walking distance to just solid houses. Um, when I was, as I was growing up. So by the time I was in high school, uh, you know, it was full. And so that was, that was basically the experience of like, watching um you know natural environment get filled in by by houses uh, and, and can i ask you what were the value the important values 
of your family in your family what were the things your family tend to value in terms of value system mm. definitely hard work um inquisitiveness so my aunt was very inquisitive my mother was quite practical so my mother was a uh, farmer from minnesota or from a farming town in minnesota um very hard worker we used to call her the ant uh because ants just don't stop moving uh you know she was a bit like that um, um also quite tough she used to get um dental work without anesthesia dentist, oh my god the dentist would say he'd never seen anything like it she just gets his drill drill me and sits there um so uh she's she's relatively tough she would always used to make fun of us for you know kind of being sissies or whatever i mean her words not mine uh in in in, <laughs> in chicago because we you know we complain about the cold you know in minnesota it's like canada so um you know it's a very very cold environment uh but also um you know quite creative she was good at like making art projects and things she's an avid quilter uh as well so she's got kind of a creative side right my, my and who we spent a lot of time with uh, was a, this is my father's sister, was a um, uh, a teacher of, of gifted children in the inner city in Chicago. So it was a all black school that she was a teacher, teacher at, um, and she was the gifted teacher, gifted, you know, gifted education teacher there. Uh, she was very like uh, imaginative. So we played like if when we got into Dungeons and Dragons, she played Dungeon Master sometimes. Uh, she was like, she was up for that, you know, and other kinds of anything kind of crazy and whimsical. And she, then she was up for it. And, um, you know, we'd go to kind of events in the city. So on the weekends, we'd go into the city with our aunt. She'd take us around to, you know, interesting mind expanding stuff. Wow. Um, Sounds like she had quite an influence on you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was like having two mothers. So my father died when I was quite young. So I was in, he was a uh, successful American football coach in high school. So he won what would be the equivalent of like five state championships. There wasn't a state official state championship at that time, but his, his teams were voted by newspaper reporters as the best teams in the state. Um, on I think five or six, no, five occasions. And then he actually won it, won the title after there was, there was, it was created like a playoff system and, and then retired uh, to become a custom home builder. So that's, you know, the custom home thing came afterwards. Um, and yeah, he was very like uh, quite tough guy, but sensitive. He would like cry, cry like a baby on the dog died. It's a very Irish thing, like the warrior mm -hmm. poet, you know, that people are both emotive and somehow fiery. So he had that kind of his father was was an Irish immigrant. So I, I didn't meet my my Irish grandparents, but it's kind of like they were still you know, people talked about my grandfather so much. So this kind of like combination of of you know fieriness or like a, almost like a warrior mentality that you know like a football coach would have with a kind of a sensitivity was really um part of the those things aren't contradictory, might be you know, I guess part of my upbringing um, as well. And Got it. So you have a, if I have a bit of the picture of, of where you grew up, you grew up in the suburb of Chicago, like quite normal suburb of Chicago, and you have a, your aunt, why you really hear is that she, she's really someone who stimulates you creatively and, and also intellectually to inquire about things. And, and was there a moment in your childhood where you really felt like, oh, what was like, sorry, let me rephrase that. Was it a moment in your childhood or when you grew up that you noticed that maybe you perceive the world slightly differently than what the majority of people tend to perceive the world? Well, and yeah, I mean, I got that a lot from teachers, you know, um, kind of say that I was, um, you know, different or something like that. Um, I was distracted a lot in class, um, so. And can I ask why do you think you were different as a kid? It might be, you know, I mean, you know, part of it is probably I'm just, you know, neurotypical. Uh, 
because I mean, definitely I've uh, scored off the charts at ADHD. They sent me to the school counselor. I think I had two desks because I had so much stuff. I could never keep track of things. So I would kind of come to school with this huge bag full of, full of stuff, you know, and I, just, I wouldn't forget everything. And I just take like all my books with me all the time. So I wouldn't forget any of them. I just like, walked around with all of my books, which was, you know, rather ridiculous but you know it got the job done uh and um yeah i think yeah there's that and you know i basically had kind of a my, and my mother to be honest with you really believed in creativity so she wasn't intellectual and she was but she did like the arts a lot so she had a lot of respect for the arts you know she's very into like creativity um and and she believed in promoting creativity. So kind of when the art teachers kind of said that I was being too creative, she was just like, well, whatever, wasn't following the, the rules. She was like, well, who cares? You know, your rules are, cause he, he, you know, there was this kind of art teacher who won, but there's a very like, it's supposed to be done this way and within these boundaries. And then I would kind of instinctively want to do something else. And, and, and she was just like, well, yeah, fine you know it's, it's it's interesting your ones are better or more interesting or, or anyways you shouldn't you shouldn't um yeah just following the rules like paint by numbers type of artwork was, mm -hmm. yes you know her her thing she was basically like yeah don't don't do paint by numbers don't, don't just get a coloring book you know she she hated coloring books she's like not buying coloring books you just here's some crayons and this blank piece of paper or just make your own picture Color, mm. <laughs> coloring books just sap your mind your creativity right so um she she was very my mother was very you know forward about that yeah so i really hear that she helped you nourish your creativity but also safeguarded from uh potentially other other people trying to put you into a box yeah yeah also my grandmother I remember we visited my grandmother and I would do this like hyperactive hopping around it was like Calvin and Hobbes so I would go into the, the woods right basically like bounding around and and you know in in Chicago and so where we were was basically near forest preserves it still is that's nice nice thing is that the, so much of the nature was taken away but um there's still kind of forest preserves which are you know public land where you can walk and just disappear into the forest for hours. Um, which when I go back, it, kind of all I do is walk around the forest preserves. Um, um, but my grandmother, you know, when we visited Minnesota, didn't really like the way that I bounded around, you know, in kind of my own inner Calvin and Hobbes esque world, uh, and would kind of say, "You just be behave more normally. You can't behave strangely like that," and so forth. And I. I told my mom and she's like, she said, oh, she, she say that. And then she kind of see this kind of like, you know, very like mean, you know, kind of look come across her face. And she, she goes in the other room and then I hear her just like, you know, blasting my grandmother. It's just like, wow. You know, like very, very like harsh, uh, you know, kind of basically fuck right off kind of you know and stuff I, I hope your, your podcast not it's not too wholesome but you know it was basically basically the you know the message that was sent so you know yeah in in, in various ways mm. yeah and is there a, um yeah what do you think is there maybe a distinct uh, moment in your life where you felt like, oh, you took a direction that was maybe not as predictable? Um, gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, various. Uh, let's see here. I mean, generally, kind of the things I did of I draw, drew, drawing constantly, kind of spending a lot of time um, thinking about science fiction worlds and, you know, strange possibilities and like kind of large murals that I used to, to draw um, about 
various scenes and I would spend a lot of the time in imagination. You know, I was quite a dreamer as a kid, so it was very unusual. As far as like life directions, um, I mean, I went to university, um, you know, I met a lot of very strange people. So I, I learned mathematics from a very eccentric person. I was quite, I always scored well in those math tests, but I'd had no interest in the subject. And then I met, you know, mathematicians who were particularly strange, whimsical people. Yeah. So they were, um, you know, quite encouraging because I was like, oh, other kind of people who think really differently. Uh, and then one of, one of the math teacher that I uh, gravitated towards the most, I ended up working in this program that he was, he was, um, he helped to found, so I taught calculus. Uh, and then he knew someone in New York uh, at, at a place called the Conference Board that he met a dyslexia uh, conference. Um, so, you know, actually he kind of noticed that I was probably slightly dyslexic, uh, and uh, which, which I am as well, so slightly dyslexic. Uh, and um, yeah, and introduced me. So, you know, going, I moved to New York straight after, uh, University and kind of, you know, that was a bit like made friends with a lot of bohemian characters. Uh, and I mean, let's see, there's there's that. I, I mean, I could go on describing it, but it was very much like, it's a bit like I lived in a squat for a while after I made some friends was like rent, but real. Um, you know, there was a lot of, it was one of those places that was a legitimized squat that kind of happened in the eighties called the Umbrella House. Um, Avenue D uh, in the East Village uh, with my roommate Hassan, who is a, uh, he was from Compton, California. He was a classical composer, uh, you know, by tr trade, uh, kind of um, also gay, uh, kind of like built a harpsichord when by, by after buying one from buying it with his, his, his father's credit card, his grandfather's credit card, rather, you know, so. Um, you know, there was, there was meeting people like that. I went back to, to California, uh, to Compton with, to visit Hassan. That was also, you know, kind of an eye-opening trip. Like, oh yeah, this is very, you know, different than, um, what I was used to, um, also. And in which way was it eye-opening for you? Which one? In which way was it eye-opening for you? In, my, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, people were, I mean, it wasn't what you expected, you know, kind of like supposed to be scary. It wasn't particularly, you know, scary most of the time. It was at nighttime. It was scary. You know, people would kind of move between their houses really fast, but then during the daytime, um, you know, there was just a lot of really fun people that, you know, had lots of parties and um, went to concerts and went out dancing and, and uh, you know, was with the, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, the, a lot of the gay element of, Comp of Compton. So I'm not gay myself, but I, I always had gay friends, you know, so I would quite like, so Hassan knew a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, the gay community in Compton. So young, young gay Comptonites, we went out to kind of places that they would go to um, and, you know, to, to, dance clubs and so forth and and um yeah i mean yeah i could tell stories but it's but at the same time there was like uh you know the first night we were we were there um people were talking about the history of compton um and and how there was a crack epidemic at some point it used to be sort of the mecca so if you're um if you're black and it were making it it was kind of like the middle class area that you wanted to live in it's part of the reason why there's all these famous people you know like um yeah, you know, like uh, the Williams sisters and, and things yeah. like that, right? Uh, who come from that area. It has like good schools and good youth education. Compton Youth Orchestra, you know, produced a lot of musicians and so forth. And then, the, you know, there's this, this, it's also unfortunately a really good um, position to be center of a drug trade because of its near shipping terminals. And so, um, kind of drugs came through and crack especially turned into a you know a, an industry and then it kind of a lot of difficulties started happening and as as people are telling this story then the, you could hear the helicopters overhead you know and like oh they're shooting tonight 
and you could hear like the because the helicopters were police helicopters, which meant there was some type of you know gang conflagration, and everybody kind of like moved their chairs so that there was cover. Um, and and we then we continued talking, so people kind of took cover behind door frames and things, and kept on passing around the joint and you know hiding behind couches and continued the conversation as normal, which is you know I'd never experienced anything like that before at the time, uh, kind of mm -hmm. taking cover from straight bullets while having a conversation. So, I mean, that was um, certainly eye-opening, but it was so much as well was that, you know, most of the time it was like just a really fun place to be, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with a lot of really great people, uh, you know, who had, you know, just of all types, um, you know, lawyers, there's next door neighbors were like very, high-flying lawyers, uh, you know, who had a lot of love for the community and you know, were still there despite, of course, you know, the fact that there's some issues. Um, I think, like, you touch on one, in telling the story, you really touch on something that I really feel that is very uh, particular and unique to you, Liam, is that you're someone who's very open to people, who's mm -hmm. also very open in meeting people and people from all various backgrounds and, and um you also have quite a, a curiosity in in uh, in people, in uh, their stories, and and have a sense that some of your life path has also been because you have this openness towards people, and and it's by meeting them that you got to meet someone else, and meet someone else, and got there, and got there. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of letting you carried by the encounters. Um, uh, there's something I yeah, we'll see on the recording if that goes, but there's something I also feel that is really unique to you, Liam, is that, well, in the very uh, few, mo few times where I feel like I touch a sense of awareness or nothingness, or if I had taken um, a psychedelic, I often really think about you. And I remember Nina also mentioned that, it's like, oh, Liam. Like that's how Liam experienced the world probably most of the time in some some form, mm -hmm. and uh, like and and I don't know from what you said is like I have a sense that and actually these states are often very like pure states where we're not so um, I think children experience the world probably a little bit more like that, mm -hmm. um, and then we're made and I just from what you said about your mother it just seems that she also let you maintain that you know that that sense of like being in the world um like yeah I'd like to kind of hear a little bit about because there, there are moments where I, I definitely know that I I can be also quite like that um and I'm coming gradually as I grew up you really realize that's not how most people perceive or experience the world you know they don't get themselves lost into like you know gazing into a flower or looking at the water movement or you know yeah. like seeing the cloud pass and just being like I could just watch a cloud pass for another hour yeah <laughs> yeah know? absolutely yeah and I sense that with you you've maintained that quality that is actually quite childlike. Um, now I have Atian, and Atian could like easily spend an hour, you know, just watching the tractors or like watching the the machine, like just watching things go. And uh, it's been great practice for me to retouch that childlike, just being letting yourself absorb in the in the unfolding of life. Mm -mm -mm. Um, and yeah, I, I guess. Um, And I think why I'm talking about this quality is that I believe this quality and having maintained this quality is also what has you have probably quite a different path mm -hmm. to what I will call um, the more common path that is taken by people, which is like, find a, you know, you're older than me also, like in the 80s, like, like 90s, finding a good job that pays really well and have a family and, you know, pay off your mortgage. And, yeah. and um, so yeah. I'd like to kind of inquire a bit about this quality that has you then 
live a life that is not so um that is in a way more radical and more free yeah um well yeah so i just say the 2000s I, I was my 20s were in the 2000s so um, so what did I say? Um, first of all, you know, one thing is that I, you know, I probably was always a little bit strange that like, yeah, you know, there was this time and then I realized kind of maybe how weird I was in high school because I was sitting in homeroom and then the class stoner comes up to me and he's like, hey, dude, I have a question for you. And I was like, well, what, what, what's, what's going on, Cheech? That was his name. His name was, everybody called him Cheech, like from the stoner movies. He's like, what are you on? And I was like, what do you mean? And he, he's like, you know what I'm talking about, dude. Are you on, are you high all the time? Do you come to school at LSD? What is it? And I, and I looked back and I'm just like, well, I'm not in, I'm not in anything. He's like, I've never taken a drug. And he, it was like the most, you know, unusual. He was like, really? No, I don't believe you. And I was like, yeah. You know, I mean, at the time I was a bit incredulous. I wasn't, so I'm probably not doing the last part. Yes. No, it, no. But... It was a bit like, no, I don't, you know. Oh, my... it's, it's funny that you tell the story because as you tell it, I have the exact same thing happen to me. I'm like 18, dancing my ass off, like, because I just love dancing. Mm -hmm. I'd go to this nightclub to dance, dance, dance. And people would come to me and be like, what do you take? And I was like, water. And I was like, no, but what do you take? I just drink water. And I kept dancing. And I really generally did not understand that they were asking me what drugs I took, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and so, you know, that would exactly, you know, there is something you know, like I was always a bit, a bit strange, you know, so I wouldn't, I was always, I definitely got feedback that I was, I was, and, you know, and then, you know, Cheech went back and he'd been sent over from the, the stoner table, right? All the kind of stoner, stoner kids sat together and he, he like conferred and then and he's like, yeah, he's not, he's not anything. And, I was like, yeah. and then, but the one kid, I think his name was Tim McDonald. I, th I think I did his last, but his first name was Tim. Uh, he was, he was like, I told you, because he went to like grammar school with me, right? So he knew I was always weird. He knew I was on LSD when I was like five, right? So he would, he had been telling them that, no, he's just weird. And, you know, I wore like psychedelic pattern shirts that my mom would, knew that she like, I like these psychedelic pattern shirts and she'd like find them and like, you know, bring them home. Like, oh, you like this one? It's like, oh yeah, I like that one. You know, <laughs> this, this, <laughs> psychedelic pattern shirts right so uh you know it wasn't it was you know i was and then of course i found uh i sort of as soon as i heard of like buddhism i was like oh that's interesting we read siddhartha in high school and i, I was so and that was definitely another part of it is that i read siddhartha in high school and i i was definitely like hmm i think he's I think this guy's onto something i'm gonna i'm gonna learn more about this buddhism stuff uh and that's perfect it leads to my actually question i wanted to ask you which was like what is a book that might have like open your realm and it just sounds like this one has and what in it touched you that had you like oh he's onto something i want to kind of like inquire more what maybe you don't remember it's just an impression but what in it had you kind of like want to inquire more it was, you know, that, I mean, the basic idea that when he started talking about the kind of suffering arises with attachment, that it was possible, like, kind of to be free from suffering if you looked at, at life a certain way. Um, you know, I, I, at the time, I thought this is really interesting. I'm not sure this is the clearest exposition of this, you know, whatever of what he's talking about. And there seems to be some kind of like, magical romanticization in it and i read a few other things you know to be honest you know about buddhism that we were at the school library afterwards and i was like oh well this is really interesting because i you know there was also like they talked about the the wants of man how we kind of want pleasure kind of like sensory pleasures and wealth and then fame uh then meaning and purpose and then finally enlightenment and it's like a 
it's kind of interesting that you, yeah, like basically get obsessed with these things and find out that they're not really um, what you want, you know. Okay. So I mean, you know, my father dying young, I think, as well is like another thing that. So when I was in what the second grade, uh, which is about seven years old, uh, my father had seizures because he was football player he'd, he'd taken like a hit in a game and then had seizures for the rest of his life um and um he he basically uh, drove into a lake uh after having a seizure and, and and drowned to death right so i think there's something about me wondering what is life all all about you know there's something about someone dying that makes you ask a lot like kind of different questions about when you're conscious of life can be ending any moment. I think I, I asked different questions than, than most people. And so when I read about the wants of man, I was like, yeah, okay, that kind of explains it because everybody's so unhappy. You know, my mother was quite money-minded um, at that time. Um, you know, she's, she's not, but at the time she was, and people would, a lot of people were very money-minded in my environment. And I kind of noticed that they weren't very happy. And I'd ask myself a number of times, like, couldn't they just be have, like, why do they need all this stuff? You know, because you could look in geography books and realize, like, were people always really unhappy in the past, or a lot of them seem to be smiling in these pictures that, you know, mm. you know, that you can just look at a geography book, like people, people from these countries that are supposed to be really poor, and, you know, hard done by. And, I mean, I understand that there's, you know, it's nice, we have nice things, but like, they, they seem like they're kind of happy without all these nice things anyway. So, um, and, you know, I personally didn't particularly care about cars and stuff or, you know, felt like just kind of hanging out with people was, was nice, uh, was nice enough and eating nice food or something, you know, and I noticed there was a lot of busyness, you know, just a lot of busyness and got out, you know, big achievement complex, you know, you know, suburban America, everybody wants to achieve, you know, it was like a standard American high school, like you see on television with the lockers and oh. uh, all of that, you know, a kind of very competitive mindset, which I just, in my situation, you know, um, mindset and probably, you know, the thing with my father dying, I was just always very, like, this doesn't make any sense to me, you know, profound, this doesn't make any sense. And then kind of the descriptions of Buddhism that I read made a lot more sense. So mm. I was drawn to it immediately. Uh, and then when I was 22 years old, I think on my 22nd birthday, a friend gave me a book of, uh, from Krishnamurti. Uh, I remember like reading it and looking up in Central Park and just like reading words and thinking, wow, yeah, this is, I've been reading all like Foucault and kind of, you know, whatever, you know, Western intellectuals and, and, you know, I thought it was interesting, but I could usually like skip forward chapters. I could kind of tell where the person was going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Logical progression. It was kind of boring. You know, I had a lot of university classes where I would, people thought I was reading the book ahead because I would just say, kind of anticipate where the teacher was going. Uh, in economics class and things like it's kind of like yeah you're gonna you're gonna say this or this is this is what seems to be what the question you're asking like no that's next chapter and, you know but and the stuff that I was read, read there I was like oh wow yeah well that I wouldn't have thought of um you know I wouldn't have thought of that that's really profound um it wasn't like the same type of um you know reasoning it wasn't it was more you know insight as they say where, where yes right and I, that really impressed me you know so it was christian birdie i'd say is like, there's like a book that really blew me away it was probably freedom from the known by jiddu krishna birdie when i was 22 years old where it was just like you know like a knife into life just crack you know like this was something else you know and i or kind of knew it was always interested in it was very you know into the idea of of Buddhism, but that particular his particular exposition, which was very like clear and lucid, at times logical, and I had a very like sharpened mind because I was a very obsessive thinker, you know, very like at that point got very into science, was really into you know part of my my kind of response to thinking I was in a world that was a bit 
messed up with well I've got to understand it so I'd already made up my mind and, and I'd spent my university years like studying psychology mathematics and economics because I kind of wanted to understand society so and then I went and got this job in New York which was you know in an economic research group applied so it was the same first job as Alan Greenspan uh, and I was trying to you know kind of understand social reality and then when I read that book though I was like oh he's like he's coming from a different angle, which has a lot more insight than anything else you've read from all these. You know, so respect. was that the kind of like start of you having your interest in neuroscience? And that was, that's where I was going to ask you. It's like, why, what motivated you to want to understand and study neuroscience? Yeah, so, you know, um, long story short, I, you know, I did economics for a, a bit. Um, and I, you know, I, I at first wanted to kind of fight it from the inside. I thought there was something very wrong with it. You know, classical economics, you know, this is in 2000, you know, back when people still believed in economic growth and whatever, you know, like, this was, we were triumph, we, you know, and I was like, this is, this is, this is messed up. You know, I was into the world social forum type kind of things, you know, and all of that uh, in university, I just read a lot and felt like, you know, capitalism um, as we run it was not doing, it was not humanity's future, um, not against business still, it wasn't it never really been against just people doing business, but something profoundly wrong with our yeah. economic system. Um, and, you know, I realized at some point that, you know, I couldn't fight it from the inside, you know, I mean, you could go into the particular experiences, but it was just basically like, you know, there was one particular time, um, reading a paper by Robert Lucas with some other people who were studying economics, uh, or who are, you know, trained to be professional economists. And I was thinking to get it, you know, getting a PhD at that, at that point, and with people who are also, um, in a master's course and I, you know, basically realized after this discussion that they were just blocking out anything that didn't fit with their, what they thought. Cause like Robert Lucas kind of makes this argument that the kind of protectionism can work if there's certain assumptions, right? Like, you know, protecting your industry as Asian economies did while growing might make sense if you assume certain things and the things that he assumed were all perfectly reasonable things right so and but this flies in the face of kind of eth economic orthodoxy and free trade and people's response to it was just kind of to ignore it and say things like I think I can explode that result and then I would ask people well can you do it and they would go and then you know kept on asking them five six seven times you know if you figured out how to explode that result yet yeah. explode meaning like make it go away or show that it's ridiculous or whatever uh, and you know they made you know, nobody, nobody had any actual real arguments against it. They just kind of ignored it, you know, uh, and most people just forgot it almost as soon as after they read it. Right. And I was like, oh, this is a religion. It's not like a proper subject. It's just a religion. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing isn't like, you know, isn't what's wrong with it. The interesting thing is why do people believe in this? Right. Like, why do people believe in this? Yes. Right, like what is what? How does it have this hold on people's minds that they kind of you know just kind of are able? They just reject anything that um, conflicts with it, you know. Uh, so understanding the ideology was the more important thing. That that's why I went uh, into neuroscience. So particularly affective cognition, it was of affect and thought was my kind of specialization in graduate school, which I went back to after working in Tanzania as an applied economist uh, until I was around 30. So I went back to get a PhD after quite some time as an applied economist, because you know, I, was all, I was very interested in understanding how things worked, economic systems. Uh, so I worked in, you know, very, in several places, understanding different economic systems, more in a kind of an applied way. Um, I didn't really go far into, you know, past undergraduate, I didn't spend a lot of time academically studying ec economics, but I did do a lot of applied economics. Um, and yeah, I mean, basically then I, I went to PhD school to understand emotion and thought because I think that was kind of really what you needed to understand 
you know, the emotional hold of economic ideas or oh. ideas on us. Wait one minute here. Amazing. It's really, it's been really uh, joyful for me to to do this podcast with you because it's like I get to rediscover you, you know, especially with friends that are becoming old friends. Mm. You take their story a bit for granted, or you take who they are a little bit for granted. And when someone gets the 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 room to really tell their stories and really have the space to just really inquire, you get um, a full picture, a much more wholesome picture. Um, mm -hmm. And I never got to ask you those questions, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, sorry. I hope how I did, went too random. How, Why else yeah. Is no, it's perfect. It's like, how did Liam became Liam? Yeah. Well, then that's, you know, that's part of Then there was graduate school, mm -hmm. um, you know, at which point I was kind of, maybe I was already me, but I was quite neurotic in graduate school. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, I started properly practicing kind of Buddhism in graduate school because I was going basically kind of nuts trying so hard to understand things uh I've studied implicit unconscious processes so I was thinking about unconscious processes like thinking about thinking and mm. it was a bit like driving me nuts since there was a certain point in which um you know I, I just decided I'd, I'd better take meditation seriously so and I could tell that story, but you know. No, I was, I was actually. It's very funny enough. Going to ask you what was your pra What is your practice currently? And um, so I know meditation is is one, but I think we have enough time for you to tell your last story, like your last story around your practice. Well, I mean, that's just how it started. Um, and know, also, maybe what you gain from it, and what are you still how does that support you today? And, and uh, maybe what had you start to practice meditation, which you just started answering and how is it supporting you today in, in what you're pursuing? Well, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. So I, I started with yoga really um, after, so I kind of, I, 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 at some point I had like, like several anxiety attacks a day. Like I used to, and during graduate school, I would like just go and study in the hospital because then I, I knew if I started, I had this kind of like submerged thing about dying, you know, it was obviously due to my father, but I kind of was like worried that I was gonna have a stroke at any moment or something like that. And, and, and this like, this kind of like anxiety that somehow my mind had made up, um, um, made up the story that I could die at any point. Um, and I think it was really, it was really more of like, I had an overall existential anxiety about like, what are we doing here? What am I doing, doing this? Because there was kind of, I was studying, you know, neuroscience, but at the same time, like you can feel the draw of the field on you to just draw you into some academic gutter, right? Like there's people doing interesting things now, right? in this metamodern space but the, like people have gone to graduate school with interest in you know societally worthwhile things for decades and they get sucked into just you know finding an ac academic niche and sitting in it and producing the same study over and over again and not yes talking about these big picture things and not really asking the questions that you need for you know a new social system or for economic transition or systems transition right and i kind of had come for systems transition i could feel this kind of like you know because none of this had hit yet none of the stuff that we're you know talking about now you know really had, had hit yet and i had this anxiety about it you know getting sucked into it it's just this you know really like soul crushing academic career and you know many academics are on you know uh antidepressants and kind of study stuff which is you know it's like when we say it's academic you know it's not it's often not the most important thing in the world uh and i had this kind of feeling like i might end up doing that and and maybe a, a kind of a lot of pressure on myself to kind of in some way break the mold but i didn't really know how uh and and so there's a huge amount of anxiety 
Um, and the one time I was visiting a friend of mine in uh, after my aunt had died, actually, so shortly there before, and, and I was visiting a friend of mine who was, who was in Las Vegas, and I was sitting in the hotel room and the television kept on turning on uh, over and over again to cancer commercials. Uh, you know, it would turn on in the middle of the night of its own accord, and then they said cancer commercials would, would come on, and they would say, they, they said things like, I just knew. And then they call this hotline. I would call this hotline number, and you know they took care of my cancer. There's all these you know people saying they just knew, and I, and I was like, you know, I'm gonna die, and, and it's a sign. And and um, and then I was like, um, I, I drove back to San Diego, and I had to pull over like three times for my anxiety attacks, and I decided. When I got there, I'm like, okay, I'm definitely going to take it seriously. Uh, and we had a, a guy who wanted meditation subjects for a study that was visiting us in our department. And so I called uh, Brother Fap Lin, uh, who's a monk at Plum Village, who, you know, I'd been introduced to by Rufus uh, and and a while ago and said, well, do you have any, um, do you know any, any brothers in your sister monastery? That is sister monastery outside of, of San Diego, which is called uh, Deer Park. And do you know anybody there who might wanna take part in a study? And then he's, he says like, well, I don't know, but we can find out because I'm gonna be there in two days with Thich Nhat Hanh. He was literally getting on a bus to, um, you know, to go to, to, to San Diego with, with Thich Nhat Hanh. So a couple of days later, I was taking a, you know, a hike um, mountains with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of Buddhist monks, uh, and that was great. And I was just like, okay, I'm gonna do this. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing taking this seriously. And I just you know registered for a yoga class and found that like yoga slowed my mind down. So I did yoga like three or four times a week, and then I um, got into vipassana after six months, and then I got into more like. Plum Village style things because uh, Vipassana, like Goenka Vipassana, you do these ten day silent retreats, and they, you can go really deep really fast. And I felt like I needed that. I basically got rid of a psychosomatic back ailment after the first one. I couldn't like sit up for more than fifteen minutes without a backache, and I got rid of most of that after ten days. And I probably reduced my anxiety symptoms by seventy percent after those 10 days uh, and I just kind of kept with it. And um, yeah, you know, I haven't had an anxiety attack in uh, at this point, 10 years, probably. So, and yeah, so how old were you when you started practicing or where you got really aware of your anxiety and, and, and decided to, to, start pra to start some practices? Uh, 30... Two. Um, yeah. yeah. And and how is this and how is the practice influencing your your work today, or maybe not just your work in general, but what you're engaged about? Um. That's. It's just in everything. To be honest with you, um, you know, I mean, I think. Um, in, because I, I, it's helpful to slow down, right? Like I don't, my mind doesn't really race that much anymore. You know, I kind of, it does sometimes, but on an average day, I'm kind of, uh, I don't really think that much when I don't need to think. You know, I've kind of, I can kind of take a walk, and I don't really think a load during during walk. I mean, it's, there's still thoughts, but if you have a stiller mind, then um, it's easier to see emotionally what's going on, easier to notice like other people's emotions. Uh, and so for like climate change, you know, climate majority project, obviously, um, sensing into the emotional texture of thoughts, of ideology, of climate communication, like simple things like noticing the emotional structure of a conversation, like people saying, well, we have the technology now for to address climate change like well what's going on with that statement right 
uh, the people who say it kind of mean, well, we've basically got new technology that's going to, that makes it possible to address climate change, even though we haven't done that much in terms of like strong laws yet. Um, but the other side kind of hears it like it's kind of easy or um, basically the system as, that we have is capable of addressing climate change, right? And it's, well, it's not really true. We've always had, you know, we've always had the technology to be making big cuts, you know, like we could have been making big cuts in emissions at any point in the last 20 years, right? You know, mm -hmm. getting to absolute zero hard, but we could be at half of where we are now, for example, um, you know, that's totally possible with the technology that we had 10 years ago, we could have started making cuts and gotten down to a much lower level, right? But to notice that that's emotionally what's going on from a, a position of slowing your mind down and really noticing how, um, like one, how kind of, how the converse, what's emotionally and unconsciously driving a conversation, mm. you know, picking at it and trying to kind of change the way people and, and unearth that. And and because it, it's a lot of what I'm doing right now is kind of looking at the kind of the particular structures of, of conversations about about climate, right? Or, you know, 1.5 is alive is another one, right? People say, oh, 1.5 is alive. I'm like, well, what they mean is kind of technically, right? Like experts who are talking, saying this mean technically, the kind of audience hears sort of practically, right? And we kind of just skip over the truth in the middle. Uh, and having like a s emotional, like ability to slow down and kind of notice the emotional kind of aspects of the conversation um, are really important for that. Like, okay, when I listen, I'm like, okay, I can kind of can see much more easily, um, yeah, how various parts of the, of the conversation are feeling about um, the statements, you know, and where they're coming from, mm. and how there's subtle movement from, you know, where we just subtly help each other skip over the truth. Got it. So what I really hear is the practice has helps one has just really helped you decrease your anxiety and slow down your mind. Um, that you don't like you engage in thoughts, or like you don't engage as much in unnecessary thoughts. Yeah. And that also it allows you to slow down enough to be able to witness or sense the the room, to sense people and to sense where they are at emotionally when touching a very delicate, emotionally charged topic, such as the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Amazing. Well, Amazing. We're, we're a bit over time, I think. And we're like, it's been really wonderful for me to, to hear your story. Um, there might be a part two. We never know, because I know that Liam has a, uh, a life bigger than life. Uh, and there's many more stories in Liam's pocket. Um, anything you'd like to add, Liam? Um, you know, check out uh, check out the the Bergerac Hub for residencies. I, I run things a lot there. Um, you know, the Climate Majority Project. You can find us on uh, Twitter and and online. But uh, yeah, I think join us for a residency sometime to kind of really see where we've gotten to in terms of in terms of practice uh and integrating that into into life in a in a i don't know a somewhat well somewhat seamless way or you know less seamed way yeah in some sense and you know what i'm walking out with is that what i really see a quality of you liam is that um you're not always going to do you don't have a problem doing something unconventional or not the majority or, or or thinking differently and really that is also really led by your first in inquiring and I also really sense that behind there's like a thirst of inquiring around truth you know mm -hmm. what's what is really going on you know both what is it really going out out there in the world in society 
but also what's really going on in here mm. as as this experience of being a human being um and uh i i i think that my intention with this podcast is that actually this quality is not uh unique to you or i or to, but is actually available for everyone to kind of be in this inquiring around truth um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's what people are very much at, at that right now. I mean, I think it's maybe for whatever reason, like life circumstances got me to start asking questions that a lot of people are asking right now a lot earlier. Um, you know, maybe I started asking them 20 years ago, um, just because I, yeah, various life circumstances, but um, yeah, I think a lot of people are looking and saying this doesn't work and what are we going to do? Um, mm -hmm. And really questioning our whole way of doing things. And, and you know, it's going to be very interesting because when everybody's questioning, that means it's possible and that means more people are going to question because there's a point to the questioning because, you know, it's kind of... I, yes, and then what I want to sense is that because sometimes questioning can be a very um, also a destructive force, you know, like questioning for the sake of questioning, questioning to take something down. But why it ends with you is actually a questioning, not just to take something down, but seeking a truth, mm -hmm. to build something up, to re to create a new. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually a really important distinction, which is questioning in the service of truth to find something rather than just questioning to just take something down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, I'm not interested very much in rebelling. Like there's this kind of, because it's sort of at the end of the day, it's sort of this moral gesture of like, I rebel against this system. I mean, you know, great. You know, it seems like not a very nice way we do it, not optimal, or there might, there's a lot of hypocrisy in society. I mean, that's all true, but if you're, we get stuck in a place of just kind of, you know, pissing on the system, but well, what are you going to replace it with? You know, I don't have a lot of interest in conversations that aren't saying, well, what are we going to replace it with? What are we going to do? What steps are we going to take tomorrow? You know, it's like reverse yes. has that kind of, you know, idea of the, the, the law of false alternative, you know, or no, no alternative rather that, basically we talk about the utopian possibilities we talk about simple practical steps we don't talk about a real journey um you know a step by step from where we are now to somewhere that's almost pretty utopian you know the practical pragmatic utopian um journey um yeah I, if people aren't talking about that i don't have that much interest you know to me that's the interesting thing i don't really have interest in any other you know, kind of like immediate little reforms and or kind of totally utopian uh, viewpoints without a pragmatic element to them. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in concentrated efforts to get somewhere, right? You know, and I think, you know, that's, that's the next stage. I mean, that's really kind of on a social level, um, that's important. You know, that's the inquiry that yeah. we I think that also has a lot of spiritual stuff in it. You know, there's a lot of weird ideas that we have, you know, like I, li I like this phrase that we've, we've come to calling it the blip, uh, you know, that, that we live just, just think about the fact that there's almost no other cultures or probably isn't any other culture in the whole history of mankind where kind of just discussion of spirituality generally is taboo. Now there have been particular spiritual spiritualities which have been taboo in all sorts of societies, but when, like just all spirituality of any kind being taboo, um, you know, you're looking at it. You know, it's it's this blip in the history, this little tiny blip, um, full of people who think that they're kind of the pinnacle of human progress, but maybe not. You know. Um, and maybe that's part of the reason why, you know, suddenly we're really questioning whether we're at the pinnacle of human progress that, um, 
yeah, the, the colloquial, the weird colloquial idea that spirituality kind of doesn't matter is just a funny idea is, is, is itself a funny idea, uh, you know, and uh, I think that's... Well, this is a, a good one to, to end with because I feel like I'd love to have a, another conversation with you to distinguish spirituality and religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think they're definitely worth worth a conversation. Well, thank you so much, Liam. Thank uh, you. Bye. Bye. Lots of love.